Part One of Second Variety by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Part One of Second Variety by Philip K. Dick. The claws were bad enough in the first place, nasty, crawling little death robots. But when they began to imitate their creators, it was time for the human race to make peace, if it could. The Russian soldier made his way nervously up the ragged side of the hill, holding his gun ready. He glanced around him, licking his dry lips, his face set. From time to time he reached up a gloved hand and wiped perspiration from his neck, pushing down his coat collar. Eric turned to Corporal Leone. Want him, or can I have him? He adjusted the view sight so the Russian's features squarely filled the glass, the lines cutting across his hard, somber features. Leone considered. The Russian was close, moving rapidly, almost running. Don't fire. Wait. Leone tensed. I don't think we're needed. The Russian increased his pace, kicking ash and piles of debris out of his way. He reached the top of the hill and stopped, panting, staring around him. The sky was overcast, drifting clouds of gray particles. Bare trunks of trees jutted up occasionally. The ground was level and bare, rubble-strewn, with ruins of buildings standing out here and there like yellowing skulls. The Russian was uneasy. He knew something was wrong. He started down the hill. Now he was only a few paces from the bunker. Eric was getting fidgety. He played with his pistol, glancing at Leone. Don't worry, Leone said. He won't get here. They'll take care of him. Are you sure he's got damn far? They hang around close to the bunker. He's getting into the bad part. Get set. The Russian began to hurry sliding down the hill, his boots sinking into the heaps of gray ash, trying to keep his gun up. He stopped for a moment, lifting his field glasses to his face. He's looking right at us, Eric said. The Russian came on. They could see his eyes like two blue stones. His mouth was open a little. He needed a shave. His chin was stubbled. On one bony cheek was a square of tape showing blue at the edges, a fungoid spot. His coat was muddy and torn. One glove was missing. As he ran, his belt counter bounced up and down against him. Leone touched Eric's arm. Here one comes. Across the ground something small and metallic came, flashing in the dull sunlight of midday. A metal sphere, it raced up the hill after the Russian, its treads flying. It was small, one of the baby ones. Its claws were out two razor projections spinning in a blur of white steel. The Russian heard it. He turned instantly, firing. The sphere dissolved into particles, but already a second had emerged and was following the first. The Russian fired again. A third sphere leaped up the Russian's leg, clicking and whirring. It jumped to his shoulder. The spinning blades disappeared into the Russian's throat. Eric relaxed. Well, that's that. God, those damn things give me the creeps. Sometimes I think we were better off before. If we hadn't invented them, they would have. Leone lit a cigarette shakily. I wonder why a Russian would come all this way. I, I didn't see anyone covering him. Lieutenant Scott came slipping up the tunnel into the bunker. What happened? Something entered the screen. And Ivan. Just one? Eric brought the view screen around. Scott peered into it. Now there were numerous metal spheres crawling over the prostrate body, dull metal globes clicking and whirring, sawing up the Russian into small parts to be carried away. What a lot of claws, Scott murmured. They come like flies, not much game for them any more. Scott pushed the sight away, disgusted. Like flies? I wonder why he was out there. They know we have claws all around. A larger robot had joined the smaller spheres. It was directing operations, a long, blunt tube with projecting eyepieces. There was not much left of the soldier. 
What remained was being brought down the hillside by the host of claws. Sir, Leone said, if it's all right, I'd like to go out there and take a look at him. Why? Maybe he came with something. Scott considered. He shrugged. All right, but be careful. I have my tab. Leone patted the metal band at his wrist. I'll be out of bounds. He picked up his rifle and stepped carefully up the mouth of the bunker, making his way between blocks of concrete and steel prongs, twisted and bent. The air was cold at the top. He crossed over the ground toward the remains of the soldier, striding across the soft ash. A wind blew around him, swirling gray particles up in his face. He squinted and pushed on. The claws retreated as he came close, some of them stiffening into immobility. He touched his tab. The Ivan would have given something for that. Short, hard radiation emitted from the tab neutralized the claws, put them out of commission. Even the big robot, with its two waving eye-stalks, retreated respectfully as he approached. He bent down over the remains of the soldier. The gloved hand was closed tightly. There was something in it. Leone pried the fingers apart. A sealed container. Aluminum. Still shiny. He put it in his pocket and made his way back to the bunker. Behind him the claws came back to life, moving into operation again. The procession resumed, metal spheres moving through the gray ash with their loads. He could hear their treads scrabbling against the ground. He shuddered. Scott watched intently as he brought the shiny tube out of his pocket. He had that? In his hand, Leone unscrewed the top. Maybe you should look at it, sir. Scott took it. He emptied the contents out in the palm of his hand. A small piece of silk paper, carefully folded. He sat down by the light and unfolded it. What's it say, sir? Eric said. Several officers came up the tunnel. Major Hendricks appeared. Major, Scott said, look at this. Hendricks read the slip. It's just come? A single runner, just now. Where is he? Hendricks asked sharply. The claws got him. Major Hendricks grunted. Here. He passed it to his companions. I think this is what we've been waiting for. They certainly took their time about it. So they want to talk terms, Scott said. Are we going along with them? That's not for us to decide, Hendricks sat down. Where's the communications officer? I want the moon base. Leone pondered as the communications officer raised the outside antenna cautiously, scanning the sky above the bunker for any sign of watching Russian ships. Sir, Scott said to Hendricks, it's sure strange they suddenly came around. We've been using the claws for almost a year. Now all of a sudden they start to fold. Maybe claws have been getting down in their bunkers. One of the big ones, the kind with stalks, got into an Ivan bunker last week, Eric said. It got a whole platoon of them before they got their lids shut. How do you know? A buddy told me. The thing came back with... with... remains. Moon base, sir the communications officer said. On the screen the face of the lunar monitor appeared. His crisp uniform contrasted to the uniforms in the bunker, and he was clean-shaven. Moon base. This is Forward Command L. Whistle, on Terra. Let me have General Thompson. The monitor faded. Presently General Thompson's heavy features came into focus. What is it, Major? Our claws got a single Russian runner with a message. We don't know whether to act on it. There have been tricks like this in the past. What's the message? The Russians want us to send a single officer on policy level over to their lines for a conference. They don't state the nature of the conference. They say that matters of... He consulted the slip. Matters of grave urgency make it advisable that discussion be opened between a representative of the UN forces and themselves. He held the message up to the screen for the general to scan. Thompson's eyes moved. What should we do? Hendricks said. Send a man out. You don't think it's a trap? It might be, but the location they give for their forward command is correct. It's worth a try at any rate. I'll send an officer out and report the results to you as soon as he returns. All right, Major. Thompson broke the connection. 
The screen died. Up above, the antenna came slowly down. Hendricks rolled up the paper, deep in thought. I'll go, Leone said. They want somebody at policy level. Hendricks rubbed his jaw. Policy level? I haven't been outside in months. Maybe I could use a little air. Don't you think it's risky? Hendricks lifted the view sight and gazed into it. The remains of the Russian were gone. Only a single claw was in sight. It was folding itself back, disappearing into the ash like a crab, like some hideous metal crab. That's the only thing that bothers me. Hendricks rubbed his wrist. I know I'm safe as long as I have this on me, but there's something about them. I hate the damn things. I wish we'd never invented them. There's something wrong with them. Relentless little. If we hadn't invented them, the Ivans would have. Hendricks pushed the sight back. Anyhow, it seems to be winning the war. I guess that's good. Sounds like you're getting the same jitters as the Ivans. Hendricks examined his wristwatch. I guess I better get started if I want to be there before dark. He took a deep breath and then stepped out onto the gray, rubbled ground. After a minute he lit a cigarette and stood gazing around him. The landscape was dead. Nothing stirred. He could see for miles, endless ash and slag, ruins of buildings, a few trees without leaves or branches, only the trunks. Above him the eternal rolling clouds of gray drifting between Terra and the sun. Major Hendricks went on. Off to the right something scuttled, something round and metallic. A claw going lickety-split after something. Probably after a small animal. A rat. They got rats, too. As sort of a sideline. He came to the top of the little hill and lifted his field glasses. The Russian lines were a few miles ahead of him. They had a forward command post there. The runner had come from it. A squat robot with undulating arms passed by him, its arms weaving inquiringly. The robot went on its way, disappearing under some debris. Hendricks watched it go. He had never seen that type before. There were getting to be more and more types he had never seen, new varieties and sizes coming up from the underground factories. Hendricks put out his cigarette and hurried on. It was interesting, the use of artificial forms in warfare. How had they got started? Necessity. The Soviet Union had gained great initial success, usual with the side that got the war going. Most of North America had been blasted off the map. Retaliation was quick in coming, of course. The sky was full of circling disk bombers long before the war began. They had been up there for years. The disks began sailing down all over Russia within hours after Washington got it. But that hadn't helped Washington. The American bloc governments moved to the moon base the first year. There was not much else to do. Europe was gone, a slag heap with dark weeds growing from the ashes and bones. Most of North America was useless. Nothing could be planted, no one could live. A few million people kept going up in Canada and down in South America, but during the second year Soviet parachutists began to drop. A few at first, then more and more. They wore the first really effective anti-radiation equipment. What was left of American production moved to the moon along with the governments. But all the troops, the remaining troops, stayed behind as best they could. A few thousand here, a platoon there. No one knew exactly where they were. They stayed where they could, moving around at night, hiding in ruins, in sewers, cellars, with the rats and snakes. It looked as if the Soviet Union had the war almost won. Except for a handful of projectiles fired off from the moon daily, there was almost no weapon in use against them. They came and went as they pleased. The war, for all practical purposes, was over. Nothing effective opposed them. And then the first claws appeared, and overnight the complexion of the war changed. The claws were awkward at first, slow. The Ivans knocked them off almost as fast as they crawled out of their underground tunnels. But then they got better, faster, and more cunning. Factories on all Terra turned them out, factories a long way underground, behind the Soviet lines, factories that had once made atomic projectiles, now almost forgotten. 
The claws got faster, and they got bigger. New types appeared, some with feelers, some that flew. There were a few jumping kinds. The best technicians on the moon were working on designs, making them more and more intricate, more flexible. They became uncanny. The Ivans were having a lot of trouble with them. Some of the little claws were learning to hide themselves, burrowing down into the ash, lying in wait. And then they started getting into the Russian bunkers, slipping down when the lids were raised for air and a look around. One claw inside a bunker, a churning sphere of blades and metal. That was enough. And when one got in, others followed. With a weapon like that, the war could not go on much longer. Maybe it was already over. Maybe he was going to hear the news. Maybe the Politburo had decided to throw in the sponge. Too bad it had taken so long. Six years. A long time for a war like that, the way they had waged it. The automatic retaliation disks spinning down all over Russia, hundreds of thousands of them. Bacteria crystals. The Soviet guided missiles whistling through the air. The chain bombs. And now this. The robots. The claws. The claws weren't like other weapons. They were alive from any practical standpoint, whether the governments wanted to admit it or not. They were not machines. They were living things, spinning, creeping, shaking themselves up suddenly from the gray ash and darting toward a man, climbing up him, rushing for his throat. And that was what they had been designed to do. Their job. They did their job well, especially lately, with the new designs coming up. Now they repaired themselves. They were on their own. Radiation tabs protected the UN troops, but if a man lost his tab, he was fair game for the claws, no matter what his uniform. Down below the surface, automatic machinery stamped them out. Human beings stayed a long way off. It was too risky. Nobody wanted to be around them. They were left to themselves, and they seemed to be doing all right. The new designs were faster, more complex, more efficient. Apparently they had won the war. Major Hendricks lit a second cigarette. The landscape depressed him. Nothing but ash and ruins. He seemed to be alone, the only living thing in the whole world. To the right of the ruins of a town rose up, a few walls and heaps of debris. He tossed the dead match away, increasing his pace. Suddenly he stopped, jerking up his gun, his body tense. For a minute it looked like... From behind the shell of a ruined building a figure came, walking slowly toward him, walking hesitantly. Hendricks blinked. Stop! The boy stopped. Hendricks lowered his gun. The boy stood silently, looking at him. He was small, not very old, perhaps eight, but it was hard to tell. Most of the kids who remained were stunted. He wore a faded blue sweater, ragged with dirt and short pants. His hair was long and matted, brown hair. It hung over his face and around his ears. He held something in his arms. "'What's that you have?' Hendricks said sharply. The boy held it out. It was a toy, a bear, a teddy bear. The boy's eyes were large but without expression. Hendricks relaxed. "'I don't want it. Keep it.' The boy hugged the bear again. "'Where do you live?' Hendricks said. In there. The ruins? Yes. Underground? Yes. How many are there? How... how many? How many of you? How big's your settlement? The boy did not answer. Hendricks frowned. You're not all by yourself, are you? The boy nodded. How do you stay alive? There's food. What kind of food? Different. Hendricks studied him. How old are you? Thirteen. It wasn't possible. Or was it? The boy was thin, stunted, and probably sterile. Radiation exposure. Years straight. No wonder he was so small. His arms and legs were like pipe cleaners, knobby and thin. Hendricks touched the boy's arm. His skin was dry and rough. Radiation skin. 
He bent down, looking into the boy's face. There was no expression. Big eyes. Big and dark. Are you blind? Hendricks said. No, I, I can see some. How do you get away from the claws? The claws? The round things that run and burrow. I don't understand. Maybe there weren't any claws around. A lot of areas were free. They collected mostly around bunkers where there were people. The claws had been designed to sense warmth, warmth of living things. You're lucky, Hendricks straightened up. Well, which way are you going? Back, back there? Can I come with you? With me? Hendricks folded his arms. I'm going a long way. Miles. I have to hurry. He looked at his watch. I have to get there by nightfall. I want to come. Hendricks fumbled in his pack. It isn't worth it. Here. He tossed down the food cans he had with him. You take these and go back, okay? The boy said nothing. I'll be coming back this way in a day or so. If you're around here when I come back, you can come along with me, all right? I want to go with you now. It's a long walk. I can walk. Hendricks shifted uneasily. It made too good a target, two people walking along, and the boy would slow him down. But he might not come back this way, and if the boy were really all alone. Okay, come along. The boy fell in beside him. Hendricks strode along. The boy walked silently, clutching his teddy bear. What's your name? Hendricks said after a time. David Edward Daring. David, what, what happened to your mother and father? They died. How? In the blast. How long ago? Six years. Hendricks slowed down. You've been alone six years? No, there were other people for a while. They went away. And you've been alone since? Yes. Hendricks glanced down. The boy was strange, saying very little, withdrawn. But that was the way they were, the children who had survived. Quiet, stoic. A strange kind of fatalism gripped them. Nothing came as a surprise. They accepted anything that came along. There was no longer any normal, any natural course of things, moral or physical, for them to expect. Custom, habit, all the determining forces of learning were gone. Only brute experience remained. Am I walking too fast? Hendricks said. No. How did you happen to see me? I was waiting. Waiting? Hendricks was puzzled. What were you waiting for? To catch things. What kind of things? Things to eat. Oh. Hendricks set his lips grimly. A thirteen-year-old boy living on rats and gophers and half-rotten canned food, down in a hole under the ruins of a town, with radiation pools and claws and Russian dive mines up above, coasting around in the sky. Where are we going? David asked. To the Russian lines. Russian? The enemy, the people who started the war. They dropped the first radiation bombs. They began all this. The boy nodded. His face showed no expression. I'm an American, Hendricks said. There was no comment. On they went, the two of them, Hendricks walking a little ahead, David trailing behind him, hugging his dirty teddy bear against his chest. About four in the afternoon they stopped to eat. Hendricks built a fire in a hollow between some slabs of concrete. He cleared the weeds away and heaped up bits of wood. The Russians' lines were not very far ahead. Around him was what had once been a long valley, acres of fruit trees and grapes. Nothing remained now but a few bleak stumps and the mountains that stretched across the horizon at the far end, and the clouds of rolling ash that blew and drifted with the wind settling over the weeds and remains of buildings, walls here and there, once in a while, what had been a road. Hendricks made coffee and heated up some boiled mutton and bread. Here. He handed bread and mutton to David. 
David squatted by the edge of the fire, his knees knobby and white. He examined the food and then passed it back, shaking his head. No. No? Don't you want any? No. Hendricks shrugged. Maybe the boy was a mutant, used to special food. It didn't matter. When he was hungry, he would find something to eat. The boy was strange, but there were many strange changes coming over the world. Life was not the same any more. It would never be the same again. The human race was going to have to realize that. Suit yourself, Hendricks said. He ate the bread and mutton by himself, washing it down with coffee. He ate slowly, finding the food hard to digest. When he was done, he got to his feet and stamped the fire out. David rose slowly, watching him with his young, old eyes. We're going, Hendricks said. All right. Hendricks walked along, his gun in his arms. They were close. He was tense, ready for anything. The Russians should be expecting a runner, and answer to their own runner. But they were tricky. There was always the possibility of a slip-up. He scanned the landscape around him. Nothing but slag and ash, a few hills, charred trees, concrete walls. But some place ahead was the first bunker of the Russian lines, the forward command. Underground, buried deep, with only a periscope showing, a few gun muzzles, maybe an antenna. Will we be there soon? David asked. Yes. Getting tired? No. Why, then? David did not answer. He plodded carefully along behind, picking his way over the ash. His legs and shoes were gray with dust. His pinched face was streaked, lines of gray ash in rivulets down the pale white of his skin. There was no color to his face, typical of the new children growing up in cellars and sewers and underground shelters. Hendrick slowed down. He lifted his field glasses and studied the ground ahead of him. Were they there, someplace, waiting for him? Watching him, the way his men had watched the Russian runner? A chill went up his back. Maybe they were getting their guns ready, preparing to fire, the way his men had prepared, made ready to kill. Hendrick stopped, wiping perspiration from his face. Damn! It made him uneasy. But he should be expected that the situation was different. He strode over the ash, holding his gun tightly with both hands. Behind him came David. Hendricks peered around, tight-lipped. Any second it might happen, a burst of white light, a blast carefully aimed from inside a deep concrete bunker. He raised his arm and waved it around in a circle. Nothing moved. To the right, a long ridge ran topped with dead tree trunks. A few wild vines had grown up around the trees remains of arbors, and the eternal dark weeds. Hendricks studied the ridge. Was anything up there? Perfect place for a lookout. He approached the ridge warily, David coming silently behind. If it were his command, he'd have a sentry up there watching for troops trying to infiltrate into the command area. Of course, if it were his command, there would be the claws around the area for full protection. He stopped, feet apart hands on his hips. Are we there? David said. Almost. Why have we stopped? I don't want to take any chances. Hendricks advanced slowly. Now the ridge lay directly beside him along his right, overlooking him. His uneasy feeling increased. If an Ivan were up there, he wouldn't have a chance. He waved his arm again. They should be expecting someone in the U.N. uniform in response to the note capsule, unless the whole thing was a trap. Keep up with me. He turned toward David. Don't drop behind. With you? Up beside me. We're close. We can't take any chances. Come on. I'll be all right. David remained behind him in the rear, a few paces away, still clutching his teddy bear. Have it your way. Hendricks raised his glasses again, suddenly tense. For a moment, had something moved? He scanned the ridge carefully. Everything was silent, dead. No life up there, only tree trunks and ash, maybe a few rats. 
the big black rats that had survived the claws. Mutants, built their own shelters out of saliva and ash. Some kind of plaster. Adaptation. He started forward again. A tall figure came out on the ridge above him, cloak flapping, gray-green. A Russian. Behind him a second soldier appeared. Another Russian. Both lifted their guns, aiming. Hendricks froze. He opened his mouth. The soldiers were kneeling, sighting down the side of the slope. A third figure had joined them on the ridge top, a smaller figure in gray-green. A woman. She stood behind the other two. Hendricks found his voice. Stop! He waved up at them frantically. I'm— The two Russians fired. Behind Hendricks there was a faint pop. Waves of heat lapped against him, throwing him to the ground. Ash tore at his face, grinding into his eyes and nose. Choking, he pulled himself to his knees. It was all a trap. He was finished. He had come to be killed, like a steer. The soldiers and the woman were coming down the side of the ridge toward him, sliding down through the soft ash. Hendricks was numb. His head throbbed. Awkwardly, he got his rifle up and took aim. It weighed a thousand tons. He could hardly hold it. His nose and cheeks stung. The air was full of the blast smell, a bitter, acrid stench. Don't fire, the first Russian said in heavily accented English. The three of them came up to him, surrounding him. Put down your rifle, Yank, the other said. Hendricks was dazed. Everything had happened so fast. He had been caught, and they had blasted the boy. He turned his head. David was gone. What remained of him was strewn across the ground. The three Russians studied him curiously. Hendricks sat, wiping blood from his nose, picking out bits of ash. He shook his head, trying to clear it. Why did you do it? he murmured thickly. The, the boy! Why? One of the soldiers helped him roughly to his feet. He turned Hendricks around. Look! Hendricks closed his eyes. Look! The two Russians pulled him forward. See? Hurry up! There isn't much time to spare, Yank! Hendricks looked and gasped. See now? Now do you understand? From the remains of David a metal wheel rolled. Relays, glinting metal, parts, wiring. One of the Russians kicked at the heap of remains. Parts popped out, rolling away, wheels and springs and rods. A plastic section fell in, half charred. Hendricks bent shakily down. The front of the head had come off. He could make out the intricate brain, wires and relays, tiny tubes and switches, thousands of minute studs. A robot, the soldier holding his arm said. We watched it tagging you. Tagging me? That's their way. They tag along with you into the bunker. That's how they get in. Hendricks blinked, dazed. But— Come on. They led him toward the ridge. We can't stay here. It isn't safe. There must be hundreds of them all around here. The three of them pulled him up the side of the ridge, sliding and slipping on the ash. The woman reached the top and stood waiting for them. The forward command, Hendricks muttered. I, I came to negotiate with the Soviet— there is no more forward command. They got it. We'll explain. They reached the top of the ridge. We're all that's left. The three of us. The rest were down in the bunker. This way. Down this way. The woman unscrewed a lid, a gray manhole cover set in the ground. Get in. Hendricks lowered himself. The two soldiers and the woman came behind him, following him down the ladder. The woman closed the lid after them, bolting it tightly into place. "'Good thing we saw you,' one of the two soldiers grunted. It had tagged you about as far as it was going to. "'Give me one of your cigarettes,' the woman said. "'I haven't had an American cigarette for weeks.' Hendricks pushed the pack to her. She took a cigarette and passed the pack to the two soldiers. In the corner of the small room a lamp gleamed fitfully. The room was low-ceilinged cramped. The four of them sat around a small wooden table. A few dirty dishes were stacked to one side. Behind a ragged curtain a second room was partly visible. Hendricks saw the corner of a cot, some blankets, clothes hung on a hook. We were here, 
the soldier beside him said. He took off his helmet, pushing his blonde hair back. I'm Corporal Rudy Maxer, Polish, impressed in the Soviet Army two years ago. He held out his hand. Hendricks hesitated and then shook. Major Joseph Hendricks. Klaus Epstein, the other soldier, shook with him, a small, dark man with thinning hair. Epstein plucked nervously at his ear. Austrian, impressed, God knows when, I don't remember. The three of us were here, Rudy and I, with Tasso. He indicated the woman. That's how we escaped. All the rest were down in the bunker. And, and they got it? Epstein lit a cigarette. First just one of them, the kind that tagged you. Then it let others in. Hendricks became alert. The kind? Are there more than one kind? The little boy, David. David, holding his teddy bear. That's variety three. The most effective. What are the other types? Epstein reached into his coat. Here. He tossed a packet of photographs onto the table, tied with a string. Look for yourself. Hendricks untied the string. You see, Rudy Maxer said, that was why we wanted to talk terms. The Russians, I mean. We found out about a week ago. Found out that your claws were beginning to make up new designs on their own. New types of their own. Better types. Down in your underground factories behind our lines. You let them stamp themselves, repair themselves, made them more and more intricate. It's your fault this happened. Hendricks examined the photos. They had been snapped hurriedly. They were blurred and indistinct. The first few showed David. David walking along a road by himself. David and another David. Three Davids, all exactly alike, each with a ragged teddy bear. All pathetic. Look at the others, Tasso said. The next pictures, taken at a great distance, showed a towering wounded soldier sitting by the side of a path his arm in a sling, the stump of one leg extended, a crude crutch on his lap. Then two wounded soldiers, both the same, standing side by side. That's Variety One, the wounded soldier. Klaus reached out and took the pictures. You see, the claws were designed to get to human beings, to find them. Each kind was better than the last. They got farther, closer, past most of our defenses, into our lines. But as long as they were merely machines, metal, spheres with claws and horns, feelers, they could be picked off like any other object. They could be detected as lethal robots as soon as they were seen, once we caught sight of them. Variety One subverted our whole north wing, Rudy said. It was a long time before anyone caught on. Then it was too late. They came in, wounded soldiers knocking and begging to be let in. So we let them in, and as soon as they were in, they took over. We were watching out for machines. At that time, it was thought that there was only one type, Klaus Epstein said. No one suspected there were other types. The pictures were flashed to us. When the runner was sent to you, we knew of just one type, Variety One, the big wounded soldier. We thought that was all. Your line fell to... to Variety Three, David and his bear. That worked even better. Klaus smiled bitterly. Soldiers are suckers for children. We brought them in and tried to feed them. We found out the hard way what they were after. At least those who were in the bunker. The three of us were lucky, Rudy said. Klaus and I were, were visiting Tasso when it happened. This is her place. He waved a big hand around. This little cellar. We finished and climbed the ladder to start back. From the ridge we saw. There they were, all around the bunker. Fighting was still going on. David and his bear. Hundreds of them. Klaus took the pictures. Klaus tied up the photographs again. And it's going on all along your line? Hendricks said. Yes. How about our lines? Without thinking, he touched the tab on his arm. Can they? They're not bothered by your radiation tabs. It makes no difference to them. Russian, American, Pole, German, it's all the same. They're doing what they were designed to do, carrying out the original idea. They track down life wherever they find it. They go by warmth, Klaus said. That was the way you constructed them from the very start. 
Of course, those you designed were kept back by the radiation tabs you wear. Now they've gotten around that. These new varieties are lead-lined. What's the other variety? Hendricks asked. The David type, the wounded soldier. What's the other? We don't know. Klaus pointed up at the wall. On the wall were two metal plates, ragged at the edges. Hendricks got up and studied them. They were bent and dented. The one on the left came off a wounded soldier, Rudy said. We got one of them. It was going along toward our old bunker. We got it from the ridge the same way we got the David tagging you. The plate was stamped. One V. Hendricks touched the other plate. And this came from the David type? Yes. The plate was stamped three V. Klaus took a look at them, leaning over Hendricks's broad shoulder. You can see what we're up against. There's another type. Maybe it was abandoned. Maybe it didn't work. But there must be a second variety. There's one and three. You were lucky, Rudy said. The David tagged you all the way here and never touched you. Probably thought you could get it into a bunker somewhere. One gets in and it's all over, Klaus said. They move fast. One lets all the rest inside. They're inflexible. Machines with one purpose. They were built for only one thing. He rubbed sweat from his lip. We saw. They were silent. Let me have another cigarette, Yank, Tasso said. They are good. I almost forgot how they were. It was night. The sky was black. No stars were visible through the rolling clouds of ash. Klaus lifted the lid cautiously so that Hendricks could look out. Rudy pointed into the darkness. Over that way are the bunkers, where we used to be not over half a mile from us. It was just chance Klaus and I were not there when it happened. Weakness, saved by our lusts. All the rest must be dead, Klaus said in a low voice. It came quickly. This morning the Politburo reached their decision. They notified us, forward command. Our runner was sent out at once. We saw him start toward the direction of your lines. We covered him until he was out of sight. Alex Redrivsky. We both knew him. He disappeared about six o'clock. The sun had just come up. About noon, Klaus and I had an hour relief. We crept off away from the bunkers. No one was watching. We came here. There used to be a town here, a few houses, a street. This cellar was part of a big farmhouse. We knew Tasso would be here hiding down in her little place. We had come here before. Others from the bunkers came here. Today happened to be our turn. So we were saved, Klaus said. Chance. It might have been others. We we finished, and then we came up to the surface and started back along the ridge. That was when we saw them, the Davids. We understood right away. We had seen photos of the first variety, the wounded soldier. Our commissar distributed them to us with an explanation. If we had gone another step, they would have seen us. As it was, we had to blast two Davids before we got back. There were hundreds of them, all around, like ants. We took pictures and slipped back here, bolting the lid tight. They're not so much when you catch them alone. We moved faster than they did, but they're inexorable, not like living things. They came right at us, and we blasted them. Major Hendricks rested against the edge of the lid, adjusting his eyes to the darkness. Is it safe to have the lid up at all? If we're careful, how else can you operate your transmitter? Hendricks lifted the small belt transmitter slowly. He pressed it against his ear. The metal was cold and damp. He blew against the mic, raising up the short antenna. A faint hum sounded in his ear. That's true, I suppose. But still he hesitated. We'll pull you under if anything happens, Klaus said. Thanks. Hendricks waited a moment, resting the transmitter against his shoulder. Interesting, isn't it? What? This new type, the new varieties of claws, we're completely at their mercy, aren't we? By now they've probably gotten into the UN lines, too. It makes me wonder if we're not seeing the beginning of a new species. THE new species. Evolution. The race to come after man. Rudy grunted. There is no race after man. No? Why not? 
Maybe we're seeing it now, the end of human beings, the beginning of the new society. They're not a race. They're mechanical killers. You made them to destroy. That's all they can do. They're machines with a job. So it seems now, but how about later on, after the war is over? Maybe when there aren't any humans to destroy, their real potentialities will begin to show. You talk as if they were alive. Aren't they? There was silence. They're machines, Rudy said. They look like people, but they're machines. Use your transmitter, Major, Klaus said. We can't stay up here forever. Holding the transmitter tightly, Hendricks called the code of the command bunker. He waited, listening. No response. Only silence. He checked the leads carefully. Everything was in place. Scott, he said into the mic, can you hear me? Silence. He raised the gain up full and tried again. Only static. I don't get anything. They may hear me, but they may not want to answer. Tell them it's an emergency. They'll think I'm being forced to call, under your direction. He tried again, outlining briefly what he had learned, but still the phone was silent, except for the faint static. Radiation pools kill most transmissions, Klaus said after a while. Maybe that's it. Hendricks shut the transmitter up. No use. No answer. Radiation pools? Maybe. Or they hear me but won't answer. Frankly, that's what I would do if a runner tried to call from the Soviet lines. They have no reason to believe such a story. They may hear everything I say. Or maybe it's too late. Hendricks nodded. We better get the lid down, Rudy said nervously. We don't want to take unnecessary chances. They climbed slowly back down the tunnel. Klaus bolted the lid carefully into place. They descended into the kitchen. The air was heavy and close around them. Could they work that fast? Hendricks said. I left the bunker this noon, ten hours ago. How could they move so quickly? It doesn't take them long. Not after the first one gets in. It goes wild. You know what the little claws can do. Even one of these is beyond belief. Razors, each finger. Maniacal. All right. Hendricks moved away impatiently. He stood with his back to them. What's the matter? Rudy said. The moon base. God, if they've gotten there. The moon base? Hendricks turned around. They couldn't have got to the moon base. How would they get there? It's, it, it is impossible. I can't believe it. What is this moon base? We've heard rumors, but nothing definite. What is the actual situation? You seem concerned. We're supplied from the moon. The governments are there, under the lunar surface. All our people and industries, that's what keeps us going. If they should find some way of getting off Terra, onto the moon. It only takes one of them. Once the first one gets in, it admits the others. Hundreds of them, all alike. You should have seen them, identical, like ants. Perfect socialism, Tasso said. The ideal of the communist state. All citizens are interchangeable. Klaus grunted angrily. That's enough. Well, what next? Hendricks paced back and forth around the small room. The air was full of smells of food and perspiration. The others watched him. Presently Tasso pushed through the curtain into the other room. I'm going to take a nap. The curtain closed behind her. Rudy and Klaus sat down at the table, still watching Hendricks. It's up to you, Klaus said. We don't know your situation. Hendricks nodded. It's a problem. Rudy drank some coffee, filling his cup from a rusty pot. We're safe here for a while, but we can't stay here forever. Not enough food or supplies. But if we go outside? If we go outside, they'll get us. Or probably they'll get us. We couldn't go very far. How far is your command bunker, Major? Three or four miles. We might make it. The four of us. Four of us could watch all sides. They couldn't slip up behind us and start tagging us. We have three rifles. Three blast rifles. Tasso can have my pistol. Rudy tapped his belt. In the Soviet Army we didn't have shoes always, but we had guns. With all four of us armed, one of us might get to your command bunker. Preferably you, Major. What if they're already there? Klaus said. Rudy shrugged. Well, then we come back here. 
Hendricks stopped pacing. What do you think the chances are they're already in the American lines? Hard to say. Fairly good. They're organized. They know exactly what they're doing. Once they start, they go like a horde of locusts. They have to keep moving, and fast. It's secrecy and speed they depend on. Surprise. They push their way in before anyone has any idea. I see, Hendricks murmured. From the other room, Tasso stirred. Major? Hendricks pushed the curtain back. What? Tasso looked up at him lazily from the cot. Have you got any more American cigarettes left? Hendricks went into the room and sat down across from her on a wood stool. He felt his pockets. No, all gone. Too bad. What nationality are you? Hendricks asked after a while. Russian. How did you get here? Here? This used to be France. This was part of Normandy. Did you come with the Soviet army? Why? Just curious. He studied her. She had taken off her coat, tossing it over the end of the cot. She was young, about twenty, slim, her long hair stretched out over the pillow. She was staring at him silently, her eyes dark and large. "'What's on your mind?' Tasso said. "'Nothing. How old are you?' Eighteen. She continued to watch him, unblinking, her arms behind her head. She had on Russian army pants and shirt, gray-green, thick leather belt with counter and cartridges, medicine kit. You're in the Soviet Army? No. Where did you get the uniform? She shrugged. It was given to me, she told him. How, how old were you when you came here? Sixteen. That's young. Her eyes narrowed. What do you mean? Hendricks rubbed his jaw. Your life would have been a lot different if there had been no war. Sixteen. You came here at sixteen to live this way? I had to survive. I'm not moralizing. Your life would have been different, too, Tasso murmured. She reached down and unfastened one of her boots. She kicked the boot off onto the floor. Major, do you want to go in the other room? I'm, I'm sleepy. It's going to be a problem, the four of us here. It's going to be hard to live in these quarters. Are there just the two rooms? Yes. How big was the cellar originally? Was it larger than this? Are there other rooms filled up with debris? We might be able to open up one of them. Perhaps. I really don't know. Tasso loosened her belt. She made herself comfortable on the cot, unbuttoning her shirt. You're sure you have no more cigarettes? I had only the one pack. Too bad. Maybe if we get back to your bunker we can find some. The other boot fell. Tasso reached up for the light cord. Good night. You're going to sleep? That's right. The room plunged into darkness. Hendricks got up and made his way past the curtain into the kitchen and stopped rigid. Rudy stood against the wall. His face was white and gleaming. His mouth opened and closed, but no sounds came. Klaus stood in front of him, the muzzle of his pistol in Rudy's stomach. Neither of them moved. Klaus, his hand tight around his gun, his features set. Rudy, pale and silent, spread eagled against the wall. What? Hendricks murmured, but Klaus cut him off. Be quiet, Major. Come over here. Your gun. Get it out. Hendricks drew his pistol. What is it? Cover him. Klaus motioned him forward. Beside me. Hurry up. Rudy moved a little, lowering his arms. He turned to Hendricks, licking his lips. The whites of his eyes shone wildly. Sweat dripped from his forehead down his cheeks. He fixed his gaze on Hendricks. Major, he, he's gone insane. Stop him. Rudy's voice was thin and hoarse, almost inaudible. What's going on? Hendricks demanded. Without lowering his pistol, Klaus answered. Major, remember our discussion, the three varieties. We knew about one and three, but we didn't know about two. At least, we didn't know before. Klaus's fingers tightened around the gun butt. We didn't know before, but we know now. He pressed the trigger. A burst of white heat rolled out of the gun, licking around Rudy. Major, this is the second variety. 
End of Part One of Second Variety by Philip K. Dick.